Correct. So that's where Amon and Aman, Amon and Aman were. Yes. Our soul condition before incarnation yes. is a six sphere condition. Right. Yep. And then, so over time, uh, soul condition is de degraded, uh, de de degenerated, yep. um, down to the first sphere. First sphere condition. But now the first sphere is many, many sub layers. Is that right? That's right. There's there's thousands of them. Is that the same in the other spheres as well, or yes. is it just that we've gone into a downward spiral? <laughs> <laughs> it is true that that is the same as the, the other spheres. The other spheres all have layers, and so there are different layers. You can be a high in the third sphere or a lower in the third sphere. There are, you could think of every layer, if you like, every sphere as having layers in terms of every layer being a lesson, a lesson in love. So there are literally hundreds of lessons in love or thousands of lessons in love in the first sphere of the spirit world that we can learn. And uh, there's, th there's hundreds of lessons in love in every sphere, in fact. And so you could think of them as layers in that dimensional existence. So a person who's living in a lower third sphere condition, for example, would find it a bit uncomfortable living in a higher third sphere condition in the same dimension. And the reason why is because they haven't learnt certain lessons of love yet and they feel a bit uncomfortable with those lessons because they've not let, yet entered them. So I'm right in thinking that if we drew the parallel to the physical world that we live in, that some are living in mansions on you know, the foreshores of Sydney Harbour yeah. and others are living in uh, Tagra and yeah. others are living in, um, you know, the slums of Harlem or wherever and then others living in caves, right? Yeah. yeah. Is that sort of how it's broken up? You're all sort of segregate. You, gen you tend to communicate with, uh, congregate with uh, other people of a similar level yes, as you. Yes, but, but your analogy probably isn't a good one to use because it actually is not based on soul condition. It's based on material wealth, and so it's not really probably a good analogy to use, um, I feel, because many times the people with greater material wealth actually have a poorer soul condition. Yeah, but what I'm related to is there's no material wealth in the, any of the spheres, is there? So well, there, is. Sort of, yeah. there is. Mm. Well, not in the way that you conceive it. It's not like money, but you have... Like obviously in the higher spheres, you have a better house than if you would have it in a lower sphere. Yeah, yeah, but that's built from your soul condition, Spot right? Spot on. Yeah. Okay. So, but what I'm trying to explain through that analogy is that you're actually congregating with people at a similar level of soul condition as you, even though you're on the same. Earth. Even though you're on the same level. Yes. Yeah? Spot on. Yeah. And that's exactly what it's like in the, in one sphere of the spirit world. So, so for example, many of the murderers in the spirit world will all be in the same or similar locations, depending on why they murdered even. Even why they murdered may even cause them to be in a different location than, than just the fact that they murdered, for example. And sometimes, uh, you know, it, it all depends on the soul condition of the individual, what emotions within them cause them to do certain actions that attracts them to a certain location. So in the first sphere, the highest of the first sphere looks like the prettiest place you could get on Earth. Like if you go to a national park here or something like that, it's really pretty and you imagine living in a nice, you know, environmentally clean environment and it's just beautiful getting all the food you want. Well, the highest place in the first sphere is like that. The lowest place in the first sphere is unimaginable for the majority of you. Um, in terms of its squalor and degradation and pain. Um, and in fact, that's why many of those spirits call it the hells, because it is hellish, not fiery hellish, but hellish in terms of not only the emotion, but the condition that everyone who lives in those locations lives in. So that's, that's the gradient of love in one sphere, in one dimension. And then the similar gradient of love exists in each other dimension but above the first sphere. Yeah, I suppose that's what I was trying to work out was whether it's just the first sphere that's been subcategorized, <laughs> so to speak, or whether they're all like that. They're all like that. They're all like that. Yeah. Yeah. And each sphere has a has many lessons in love to learn. Um, not just one lesson in love. So the first sphere has a lot of lessons in love to learn. So if you enter the first sphere in the bottom of the hills which, uh, which 
the people who are the master controllers of our economic system do, for example, um, there is a lot of very, very basic emotions about love that they've got to work through before they will progress. Now, they can do it a slow way by learning them one at a time through the lessons of natural love, or they can do it a very rapid way by starting to receive divine love. But either way, they've still got to learn the lesson. And as they learn the lesson, they go then into the next sphere. And eventually you transit, you know, you, you transcend each sphere and you get to a point where you would say that you're at one with God. And that is the point that I described in the first century, the process of the new birth, and that's the transition between the seventh and the eighth sphere. But every sphere in between has all these groups of lessons of love to learn. And really what you're doing here, the beauty of living on the earth, is that we can learn lessons of love from any sphere. So I can actually be living here on earth, my surroundings be first sphere in nature, but I could actually be in a condition where I'm in the third or fourth sphere, and I could be learning lessons of love from the eighth sphere, even though I'm in the fourth sphere. And that's highly unusual in the spirit world, because usually you learn as you're living in the environment. They, the earth has a lot of advantages, the physical has a lot of advantages in terms of what you learn. And Gerard behind? Sorry, I didn't know this question already. Yeah. Just to understand the Just on that point of... Um, By the way, you can ask as many questions as you want for everybody, you don't, you're, not, you're not consigned to one. Um, on the point of learning, uh, and now I'm in my head I know, but still. Um, the, the material you're giving us, at what level is that pitched? Um, many of the divine truths I'm giving you are actually lessons in love that will lead you to a condition of atonement with God. So, in other words, they will lead you into a state of the eighth sphere of your progression. Um, that's many of the lessons I'm currently teaching you. Many of the soulmate lessons that I'll be teaching you will actually lead you in a state of a 22nd sphere progression. So in time I'll be giving more and more different types of lessons based on different types of experiences of love. But the issue is that you can't receive them very well unless you've made the previous progression. Does that make sense? Yep. And Mary wanted to say a few things about it. Oh, I just wanted to point out as well that you can learn a lot of lessons and hear a lot of truth and feel it to be truth. But unless we're also, as you're probably aware, developing our, our soul condition, releasing our errors and our emotional injuries, then um, we, we won't actually progress in the spheres, as it were. Uh, we can have the knowledge and of truth to, say, a fifth or sixth sphere level but some of our darker emotions might be holding us in a first or second sphere state and um, I was saying to Dave last night um, something that happens reasonably uh, commonly with um, AJ's teaching and the groups that happen is that people come along they feel so inspired and can really feel the truth hitting them um, but if they have a lot of resistance around dealing with their own emotions and connecting to God and um, find it find themselves holding back in that process that because all this truth is entering but nothing else is coming out it gets to be quite a painful situation um, so it's really important to focus on on both of those things yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And uh, the, tr the beauty of truth is that, uh, that it, it can expose everything in your life beautifully, but, but only if you practice it. And remember, all of these truths that you're being taught are all soul truths. They're not something you can intellectually practice, and they're not something um, that, is, that is something that you can understand intellectually. You can think you understand it intellectually, but until you actually practice it, you won't be really understanding it nor will your soul condition be changing greatly. Your soul condition does change though just by you hearing truth because it has this effect of opening up parts of you inside of your soul that allows truth to flow through you. So, so it's not a pointless exercise to hear truth but if you're not going to practice the truth eventually as Mary pointed out it does get pretty painful because you're hearing more and more and more truth but your soul condition is still not coming up with the truth. So, so sometimes you're better off sort of just applying the truths you've already heard than you are to actually, you know, keep learning more and more new truths. 
The, the second thing that's often beneficial is understanding the fact that when you feel the truth, that's when everything becomes real to you. So all the things that you're being taught you know, now, those things will become real to you only when the divine truth actually enters your soul. So until that point, it's just in your mind, and it's great being in your mind, because that certainly does open up parts of you to uh, being absorbed into your soul. And that's a better condition than not knowing the truth at all, but you'll have a lot more benefit if you allow yourself to actually feel the truth and practice it in your life. What we've also noticed too is that when a person hears more and more truth, but they don't change at the soul level, they get into more of a more of a discombobulated state, shall I say. A state, uh, I use that word, that was one of the Apostle John's favourite words, so that's, uh, he, must have been, he must be here with me at the moment. <laughs> but um, in other words, you get into a, more, a, a, a state where you feel more physical and emotional pain when you've heard truth but don't practice it. And that's... And it's a frustration, uh, anger type emotions too, you often feel. The key is to let yourself work through those emotions and then you, then you start settling with the truth actually entering you at the heart level. The truth entering you at heart level is what changes everything, not at the intellectual level. It's beautiful hearing it though, isn't it? But, but the heart level things is, is where things change. So always focus on, is this truth in my heart? You know, rather than just in my head, and pray to God about that. You know, getting the truth into your heart, rather than keeping it just in your head. And a good, a good uh, measure of to whether it is getting in your heart is if it's changing your life. If it's changing your life, everything in your life, there's a high chance that it's actually now entering your heart. If it's not changing much of your life, and externally your life looks much the same as what it actually was when you began the process, then it's yet to really enter your heart. And so talk to God about the process of entering it entering your heart. Yeah. Yep. And if we have a mic up there. And I think we'll have a break at 2.30. Oh, well, actually, we probably should have had a break half an hour ago, because I'm dying to do a wee. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, but, but we'll, ask, we'll answer, answer this question, and then we'll have a break. Um, AJ, I... Um, is it on properly? Yeah. Right up. Yeah, it's got a green light. I've got one. That's it. AJ, I have a, I've been working through watching your d uh, DVDs for yep. several months now. Yep. Um, one question in my mind, I, I am a Reiki master and I've done a healing process called heart resonance therapy. Yep. Um, about 12 months or more ago and the heart resonance therapy works with the heart but I I have a very strong feeling that it's not they say it's divine love but in my heart I don't feel it is through things that they they say and what you're saying yep. so am I harming myself by still going into the, um, the HRT the heart resonance therapy and using that and switching between working through my emotions through the di divine love way. Because one's natural one and love and one's the divine love. True, so, true. Um, I just have a feeling that I'm sort of doing myself more harm by switching. Um, well, firstly, if you're having feelings that you are, you need to look at those feelings because there's always something in the feelings you have. So that's the first thing to bear in mind. However, the world needs leaders in different things. One of the things is there's a lot of healing modalities, spiritual healing modalities on earth at the moment, all of which would, could be quite easily brought into harmony with divine love. And so it's great if we already have a background in them that uh, we can then start pondering the question as to how harmonious this particular action is with divine love. So instead of throwing out the healing modality, look at instead how you can bring the healing modality into uh, harmonious with the principles of divine love that you're learning. Can you see how if you do that, yeah. you will have a feeling when you do your heart resonance therapy on a patient, you'll have a feeling that it ha isn't actually accessing their causal emotion or their blockage emotions, right? And you will have a feeling when they're in emotions of self-deception. 
And so you need to then trust those feelings that you have and help them through those blockages that they have into opening their heart. The truth, you are right, this, the, the therapy is a natural love therapy still, even though they're calling it God's divine love, because they still view it very much, most of the time, as an energy. God, I mean, as an energy, rather than as an entity. And so if you can just change all, all is, it's just a small switch, although it's a large emotional change generally within a person, of switching between God being an energy and God being an entity. Right? Yeah. It's a large conceptual difference, but it doesn't take much to make the change if they work through it emotionally. When they do that, you can use exactly the same techniques in many cases to heal a person or to get them through different emotional conditions using God's divine love rather than just a natural love process. <coughs> Does that make sense? Though? Yes. Um, what I've sort of been doing recently um, is sort of saying I now connect to um, heart resonance therapy and divine love. But I thought, seeing I'm still saying connecting to d divine love therapy, I might be bringing in spirits who are going to keep me stuck in the divine Natural. All you need to do though there is just yeah. feel your own emotions. Do you feel like you're connecting to a spirit or do you feel like you're connecting to a divine love spirit? Like what kind of spirit are you connecting to? Is the spirit motivating you to emotionally and help them through their emotional condition or is the spirit motivating you to do physical things? Mm. Then you'll know who you're connecting to at any one time. Does that make sense? Now a spirit who's on the divine love path can motivate you to do physical things but there will always be with the principles of divine love involved. For example, principles of faith, principles of connecting to God as an entity, principles of like free will, law of attraction, all those other laws that you're learning about. All of those principles are a part of the healing process on a person. And it's a very scientific process. So a divine love spirit is a very scientific person because he understands all the science of healing much more so than a natural love spirit does. But ask yourself, are they connect, is the feeling I'm getting from the spirit that God's an energy? Or is the feeling I'm getting from the spirit that God's a real being? Is the feeling I'm getting from the spirit that he wants to heal this person no matter what the person's will is? Or is the feeling that I'm getting from the spirit that I've got to work with the free will of the person to heal them? Do you see what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. one of them will be a natural love principle, yeah. the other one will be a divine love principle, and you'll be able to tell the spirit that's with you doing the healing just by understanding those principles. Yeah. Yeah. But don't throw out the whole thing. The whole thing, no. Because doing that is pointless. You, what we need is people who are, who are used to doing different heal, healing, types of healing, with all different types of modalities and bringing those modalities into harmony with divine love. It's like I don't have any problem with there being every single current religion that's on the earth remaining on the earth as long as all of them bring themselves in harmony with love, you know, divine love or natural love even. Um, it would make the world a far better place by just bringing them all in. So it's not about destroying a lot of these things but it is about changing them in such a way that, it, that it's now loving instead of unloving. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because I've always asked, even when I, before I did the heart resonance therapy, I always asked um, of the um, angels and guides to come in of God's highest white light. So I, I presume by doing that I was asking for divine spirits to come in too. Yeah, be careful that there's a difference between the language that you use and the emotions that you have. Okay. Uh, a lot of people get caught up in saying, well, I've asked for the higher spirit or the guide and the, you know, celestial archangels or, or whatever. But if we're still very much on the natural love path, we will attract natural love spirits. So, but now that you're making a shift uh, into this divine love path, uh, don't worry so much about the language, but the, the feelings you're having. Yeah. 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 And a lot of times people say to us too, like, oh, you know, you've got to surround yourself in a white light and do this praying to God to only bring me the spirit for my highest good. The truth is that if we're on the divine path, we would understand that that's all already happening anyway. <laughs> do, do you follow me? It is yes, already I've happening. I've started to realise that lately because I used to do all that, but since I've been watching your DVDs and that now, I'm sort of just trusting now that I'm 
And it's the emotion in you that yeah. generates that, yeah. nothing else, not the thought. And so a lot of people don't realize that if I am in a soul condition where I'm in a first fear condition and I have a lot of really dark emotions, let, let's, say, let's say as a healer I'm there trying to heal somebody, but I have, actually have a, some dark emotions towards men. You know, like I think men are bastards and they've been quite cruel in my life and I'm sick to death of men and in fact I... I, I really don't want to see another man in my life, personal life, and I'm happy for other people to have men in their life, but I'm not that happy to have them in my life. And all of these emotions are in, inside of me, and I'm the healer, right? <laughs> it sounds funny, but it could happen. It's a lot. Like I've met, I've met so many healers in this place, right? And I'm the healer. So now, now I'm a woman, let's say, in that condition, and I'm the healer. A man comes in to be healed. <laughs> Now, what kind of uh, spirits are going to be with me, with this man in my house or in my, my room getting healed? And I'm in this really angry state with men. I'm really... I, I, and what am I going to attract? A heap of these women spirits who are also in angry states with men who would rather harm the man than heal him, right? <laughs> and that's who I'm going to attract. Now, now, I'm there asking for the spirit of my highest good. Now, my guide is a part of this play process, right? My guide will be trying to keep these other spirits away, <laughs> but my own soul condition will be <laughs> trying to, you know, draw these other spirits in just by, by the action of my soul condition. And so there's my guide trying to keep it away. There's my these lower spirits trying to harm the man and there's all this other stuff going my intention is I want to try and help him but actually my, my emotion is I'd really like to give him a kick in the backside and, and <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like you have all of these things going on and it's the combination of all of those things going on that determines the effectiveness of your healing. So obviously it would be far more effective if I dealt with my emotion of, of anger towards men and a man comes in, I'm not going to attract a whole group of angry women spirits who are angry with men into this session with this person. I am not going to feel angry towards this man because I've dealt with that particular emotion. Obviously now I'm connecting to some higher spirits. Now the healing session has a far more pot potential for far more power for that man than what it had before. Yep. So often I've gone along to like these um, psychic expos and things like that and I've just watched, uh, sat and watched some healers and I've seen men like who are doing the healing over the top of women actually sexually molesting the woman really like and the woman because she's having a nice feeling that's partly sexual she thinks she's being healed by someone but actually there's some spirits sexually molesting her. At a soul level? No, at, at a spirit body level. Spirit body level. Yeah. And so, and so it's very, you're very dependent on the <coughs> spiritual condition of the person doing the healing as to what spirits are attracted and what will be actually happening to you. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, let's have a break now. And uh, I don't know, how, how long would you like a break? Half an hour, yeah? What, what would you like? Half, half an hour long enough? Yeah. And we'll, so we'll come back five, ten past three. <laughs> about reincarnation and there are quite a lot of spirits who are here um, wondering about reincarnation and when, when I said the truth about reincarnation um, quite a lot of them felt uh, quite challenged by that truth and quite fearful actually too so, so it's interesting that that was happening um, can you speak into your microphone? I just want to check to see if that's working. Hello. <laughs> yeah, that's working. Okay. We're just recording the audio and and the video. Is it back on now? Good. Day. No worries. All right. Now, feeling a bit warmer. A bit warmer with the heater on. Good. Um. All right. We can keep on asking, answering your questions. Um, maybe Hiroko first, and then just. <laughs> were you putting up, yeah? Or are you just going? She <laughs> was. <laughs> and then we'll, then, then we'll go up the back there. Last week, we went to funeral, and first time, or second time, I felt love, and I felt the um, spirit present and confusion and 
try to talk to her and about truth. Yeah. And after that, we come back to home. I felt um, very uh, happy and love, yeah. and I felt um, forgiving my mother. It's not too hard. Yeah. And yeah, I just. Um, Everybody crying and sad, yeah. but two of us so happy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the both of you went along to a funeral. The both yeah. of you were pretty happy when everyone else yeah. was crying. <laughs> yes. And um, you felt, you do you feel that you felt the spirit who had passed, or or other yes, spirits? Um, yeah. I didn't feel other ones, but Just Candy. Yeah. You felt mainly the spirit mainly who had passed in a passed. sense of confusion. Yes. Yeah. Um, and did you talk to? Yes. Who was it? A man or woman? Auntie, Ken's auntie, oh, okay. female, and um, uh, we talked about, um, when we visited the hospital, we talked about truth. Oh, you visited her in hospital before she passed? Before she passed. Oh, excellent. And we knew, we knew she's going, so we talked about it. Oh, excellent. Yeah. yeah. So, um, my question <coughs> was, um, why we felt love like, after the death and everything? Um, in Japan, they put salt on it because they think they get dirty after the funeral and they treat very dark for death. Yes. But we felt so present. Yeah. So I just want to ask um, why we felt love. Yeah. Well, a lot of times when, uh, in all sorts of cultures, there's this really negative viewpoint of, of dying, right? And as a result of that, most people have a deep fear of it. And because they have a the deep fear of it, now maybe my mic's not being heard in all of this, so I better just <laughs> make sure I'm turned on as well. It is, it is working, isn't it? Yeah. Um, a lot of a lot of people feel um, when they pass a a, um, a deep sense of confusion as well, because of the misunderstandings that are going on on Earth and their own belief systems and so forth. Having the opportunity to talk to somebody before they pass is a fantastic gift you can give them. And most of you would not understand the impact it's having on them. Because it, it it, even if it just enters them intellectually before they pass, because it's one of the last things that, that they heard, it's one of the first things they remember. And because of that, they often have a lot of feelings of thanks and gratitude towards the people that have done that for them. So while they might not be that happy to hear about it before they pass, um, well after they pass, they often have a very, very strong feeling of, of gratitude and love for the persons that have done that for them. And that's one of the feelings that you were receiving, Hiroko, for, for being there and doing that for her. The, the beauty of talking to spirits uh, and talking to people before they become a spirit is they often remember everything very clearly soon after they've become a spirit. They remember your discussion, even if they disagreed with your discussion when you were having it. Uh, so, can we imagine, you, you, let's say you've never heard of the spirit world or you don't know much about it, somebody comes along just before you're dying on your deathbed and they'll all of a sudden tell you about all these things about dying and that it's nothing to worry about, you've got a lot to look forward to and they tell you a bit about the spirit world and how it all works and all those different things and then you pass and then it turns out that what they were talking about was true. That's a like uh, awesome experience for you if you've just passed. Imagine if you didn't hear that from that person. You might be floundering around in darkness for years without knowing what was going on. So it's a beautiful gift that you can give them. Yeah. And you'll receive love from the person from the person who you do that for generally. So I was receiving love from her. Yeah, from oh, her from and her. also some spirits that were surrounding her who had also heard that information when you presented to her before she passed. Oh. Does that make sense? So yeah. there's a group of spirits involved. Yeah. 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 Yes. Mm. Thank you. Now someone uh, up the back there, was. Uh, can we put the microphone there? That's it. We've, it's already a mic there. <laughs> you know how they've got all these armies on this planet, right? Fighting each other? Yep. Now, 
all these people in the army would be considered murderers, wouldn't they? Uh, yes. The generals and the ones that order all these yes. things to happen. Um, that means that this planet's full of murderers. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a bit, bit mad. So what happens with all these people who afterwards, when they pass into the other side? Um, they pass in various conditions. They don't all pass into the same place because they all have different culpability. In other words, they all have a different motivation for doing what they're doing. <laughs> Now, some people can be in a, a, a soldier and never, ever kill a person, for example. So they're a soldier that's a part of the machinery, if you like, but they've never actually dropped a bomb or, or, or shot, a, shot a rifle at somebody. They might have even been a medic, for example, in the army or whatever. So it just depends very much on their soul condition as to where they pass. But many of them do pass in quite dark states because they have these deep beliefs that it's okay to kill under certain circumstances. Which, by the way, the majority of humanity has. Like, many of us have the viewpoint that if somebody came in and killed my child, that it's okay for me to defend myself even to the point of killing that person, to stop them from killing my child. So many of us have that viewpoint. But animals kill, right? Animals kill each other to defend themselves and their nests? And well, the actually, same? animals only all that animals do is reflect human soul condition. So the reason why animals kill is because humans kill. Every single thing that happens on this planet is a reflection of, a hu of the human condition. So when mankind stop killing, so will the animals stop killing each other. In fact, uh, in India, there's this... There's this um, um, what would you call it? Um, sort of a monastery. A, it's a Buddhist monastery um, where they have lots of tigers, and these tigers um, have lived totally on a vegetarian diet all of their lives. And these tigers uh, don't kill any other animal. And you can go up to them and actually play with them, and pat them, and lay down with them, and hug them and all sorts of things. It's well known, it's, a, it's now a tourist attraction that people can go there. And, and the theory behind it is that they're all Buddhist tigers. Right? In practice what it is, is that because Buddhists generally practice the whole idea of, of non-violence, and, and these tigers have been treated in exactly the same way, the tigers reflect the condition of the people in the monastery. And because of that, they also don't have the same problem of wanting to kill other tigers or other animals. So animals are a complete reflection of mankind's soul condition. Now, you can try this at home if you want. So if you've got a pet, you can try it at home to see whether the pet's reflecting your soul condition. And what, what we've noticed really often is how much pets reflect certain soul condition things, or all of the person's soul condition, just like a child. The pet doesn't have a soul itself, but actually it's totally dependent in its emotions on its owners. In other words, the person who it connects to the most, its condition. But every animal in the planet is also connected to the human condition. Whatever the human condition is, is reflected on every, in every single animal as well. And even, even the creatures of the sea are reflected in the same way. And you can put all this into practice by just actually experimenting with your own cat or dog's or pet's condition and see what emotion you're denying, because whatever emotion you're denying, your animal will reflect at you. So you know how sometimes people get uh, a cat and then all of a sudden the cat se seemed to be a, quite a docile cat when they first bought the cat, but then after a few months the cat seems to push them around? like. We had, we had one friend who, uh, the cat, he would, he would, this cat was a stray and it came into his home and so he started feeding the cat. And after a while the cat started pushing him around. What it did was, it would, he would give it food in a certain place on the kitchen floor. The cat would come up and eat half of it. And then the cat would just sit down at the doorway of the kitchen and meow and just wait. And if he didn't move it, the cat wouldn't eat the other half of the meal. But if he moved it to a new place, the cat would always come and eat the other half of the meal. Right? 
And I, I said to the man, well, what emotion are you feeling? He said, oh, I'm just feeling manipulated. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> what kind of cat is this? Is this a male cat or a female cat? He said, oh, it's a male cat. And I said, can you see all of your father, your relationship with your father in this? Right? And when he started connecting it, he could start seeing that actually, yeah, he felt totally manipulated and controlled in the relationship with his own father. And this cat, a male cat, was doing exactly the same to him. And he was responding. He was actually allowing this cat <laughs> to completely manipulate him, right? To such an point that he was quite distressed about the cat's actions. And the cat was just reflecting the emotion within him that he was denying the expression of. And you, if, you can, if you experiment with that, any behaviour of your animals, experiment with that and just ask yourself that question, you'll be very, very surprised what happens. Now that also happens in a much larger scale. So the scale of the humanity, the animals kill other animals primarily because man kills men and animals. Right? So once man stops killing animals for food, for example, animals will stop killing animals. Once man stops killing man and stops killing animals, then animals will reflect that condition. But aren't those animals biologically programmed to eat meat? Like they've got their canines and you know, all that stuff and their digestive systems have adapted to eating um, Everything, meat. Every single thing the animal has done has, has been adapted by man's soul condition. So it's actually man's soul condition that's caused the adaption, not the animal's biological adaption. And this is one of the main uh, misunderstandings that science has on Earth, is that everything is dependent upon man's soul condition. It's man's soul condition degrading that caused the degradation of, of, of animals in their interaction with each other. And so and you, you can actually see this. When you deal with your own emotions about meat, for example, you will actually be able to, for instance, if you have a pet dog, feed your dog's meat and they will, uh, no, no meat and just vegetarian diet and they will love it and they will stay healthy. In fact, they'll actually get healthier because even their health is a reflection of your condition, your own soul condition. Everything, and this is something I keep saying in all of these sessions, everything you can think of is defined by your soul condition. Everything. Absolutely everything. Now what man has done is we've gone down this track of justifying our behaviour by the modifications made to, by our soul. So our soul gets into a certain condition, that causes our environment to be modified and then we justify our action based on the envi modified environment. It's all back to front really. We're just justifying our own error by doing that. Can you see that? It's like we're causing our own prophecy to become true by our own soul condition. If we, if we go down the opposite track, in other words, stop justifying all of these unloving things to animals and to other people, and we start acting in harmony with love and feeling the love within us towards these animals and towards people and towards everything around us, and then notice your environment change, and you will notice your environment change. Now, those that have done this with plants notice the change quite markedly. There are people doing experiments now where plants grow three times the rate because of their soul changing towards the plant. Does that make sense? Like, these things are all possible, but, but we need to experiment with them to determine the truth of them scientifically. Man doesn't. What man generally does is justify our current setting without, without understanding how it was created. So, so like, this is why sometimes I mention to people a lot about eating meat and, and all of those kind of things, because that's all part of keeping this condition on the earth the same, and we justify it to ourselves all the time by saying, oh, you know, man, like in the Bible there's this justification that man, um, animals were made for man's enjoyment, you know, in other words, that we can eat them. And, and frankly, if anybody tried, like if many of us, if you were given a lamb to slaughter so that you could have dinner tonight, the majority of you wouldn't be able to do it. Right? Um, who saw the movie, there's a movie, you know that movie with Nicole Kidman and um, Jude Law? That Cold really Mountain. Cold Mountain. Yeah. Uh, who's, you remember in that cold mountain there's a scene where this lady gets a goat who was her pet goat 
and she slaughters it and then cooks it up for him. I don't know if any of you have seen that movie. It's a really good movie, actually, a very triggering movie. But when you actually see her doing it, just something inside of you just like breaks, you know, watching her do that. And, and that's the thing is that many of us don't do it personally. And so what we do is we distance ourselves from the emotion of it. So we're quite happy to eat the meat that somebody else kills. But if you were asked to personally get your hands bloody doing it, most of us would rebel at the thought, let alone actually do it. And this is where we're not listening to our soul. If we listen to our soul, we couldn't even eat that meat. Now, of all the audiences I've ever been in front of, there's only been one or two people who've ever put up their hand and said, yes, I kill my own food. Right? And I've said back to them, you're the only honest person in the audience. <laughs> in the sense that we often ask other people to do things that our own soul could not carry out so that we don't have to take the responsibility of it. Does that make sense? So my suggestion is with all of these things happening externally on the earth, including the wars and including, ask yourself what inside of me is an emotion that could create this kind of event. So when we see wars going on on the other side of the planet, for example, ask myself, what emotions in me, what justifications in me are there where I would feel it's justified to harm another person or even to kill another person and work through that emotionally? Does that make sense? Because every single thing happening in your environment, including on the whole earth, is there to actually help you access one of your underlying emotions that's not loving. So ask yourself what's going on. When you ask yourself those things, you will make some major decisions about your life and some major feelings will come up. For instance, when I asked myself that about, about war, I realised and went through an emotion and realised that no matter what anybody did to me, I would never be able to respond in violence. Ever. And no matter even if they did it to Mary, so someone I loved, or my own children, I would still never be able to respond in violence. So that change occurred within me. And then when it came to eating meat, because I used to eat meat, I then asked myself, and there was only one time in my life where I was asked to kill an animal, and I personally couldn't do it. I was about 11, uh, 13 years old, and we were living on a farm, and uh, and we were my father was slaughtering a sheep for our for food and uh, and he asked me to do it uh, and i couldn't do it and uh, and so he did it and that's the only time i ever even got close to any personal responsibility about eating meat and then i realized that if i couldn't do it then why was i eating it there's something wrong here, something wrong at the soul level, you understand? Like something wrong inside of me that I needed to release. And once I released that, within a period of one week, I could no longer actually even eat, I couldn't even handle the smell of someone cooking meat anymore, let alone eat it. And in fact, I had one meal after that where I ate meat and I vomited it up. Like that's how much of a strong reaction now my soul had to the whole process. What about fish? Um, fish is still an animal and, uh, and it's still meat um, and fish have feelings just like um, other animals have feelings and, and interestingly enough for some reason mankind finds it easier to kill uh, marine animals or marine life than they do to kill uh, mammals um, and there are probably some psychological reasons why that is the case but in the end it's still as damaging. They don't make a sound. Did you hear what Mary just said? They, do, they don't make a sound when you kill them. Uh, I think that's what it's... You just uh, hold it a bit further apart. Me. Hold it a bit further away. <laughs> they don't make a sound when you kill them. Fish. Yeah, someone told me that once. Yeah. That, that's why we find it easier to eat them. For instance, many of us uh, might have, say, crabs or prawns. The way you normally get them is you normally get them live and throw them in boiling water. Now, you can't hear the sound of them, and that's why we do it. If, if it was an animal, you could hear that. If it was a an mammal, you could hear that happen. 
and so you wouldn't probably be able to do it. And so a lot of times we justify our actions by what we sensorily can accept. In the end, when you work through the emotion of it, you won't be able to do any of those things. Now, I've had conversations with spirits which have been very interesting on this subject. Um, I was once talking with a, a medium and she had this spirit came to her about diet. And she had this spirit came to us and, she, and this medium said, oh, you want to stick with a vegetarian diet but you're allowed to have fish, this, this spirit said. And then the medium noticed that there was a big argument going on in the spirit world between that spirit and one of the spirits who were with me. And the argument was something along the lines, um, no, we don't agree with that. Well, how can, how, what about him? He needs protein. You know, what's going on there? You know, but they were saying, well, it's actually to do with soul condition that he needs protein and there's other issues going on there. And she's saying, no, no, I don't agree with that. And then I'm saying, and then I said to the, me, the medium, and she said, oh, this, this is a big argument going on now. I, I don't know what's going on now. She just told me bits and pieces of the argument. And I said, can you ask your guide, who was the spirit who said it was okay to eat meat, uh, whether the other spirits are brighter in her, than her condition? In other words, their spirit body is brighter. And yes, her, their spirit bodies were brighter. So why, I then asked, why are you finding it hard to trust that they are in a better state of love then and therefore understand this issue better than yourself? And the spirit still couldn't accept <laughs> that um, what they were saying was true. And what they were saying was that everything that goes on in your body in terms of what you can assimilate in your nutrients with the nutrients that enter you is all based around your soul condition. So it's all based around what emotions you have within you as to how your body assimilates food. So this is why a lot of people go on a vegetarian diet and then find after a few years that their body seems to not work as well as when they were eating meat or something like that. And so they go off the vegetarian diet and back onto eating meat. But the reason why it happens is because they haven't yet dealt with the emotional reason within themselves. And in almost every case, the emotional reason is a childhood or reason connected with their parents. And often you'll see it reflected by the parents saying, oh, what? You're not eating meat? What's going on? Is something wrong? You know, they, they get very concerned and worried. And that is actually a childhood emotion being triggered in yourself. So what I've had to do is work through childhood emotions regarding eating of meat. And initially when I gave it up, I lost weight, like lots of weight and I couldn't keep my weight on. So there was an emotion in me. And once I dealt with that emotion, I started putting on weight again, even though I was, I'm eating less. So now I'm actually, when I ate meat, I used to eat six meals a day, and now I'm eating two meals a day uh, on the average. And as the guys could see last night, usually I don't eat very much either. And yet my body's now putting on weight rather than losing weight. It's all emotional. It's all to do with your soul condition, what's happening at the soul level. So every single thing, the wars around us, you know, the interaction between animals and humans, the interaction between animals and other animals, is all based on what's going inside, on inside of me at, at the emotional soul level. To actually change everything around me, all I need to begin with is changing my own soul condition. That's all I need to do. When you think about it, that gives you a lot of power, doesn't it? That means that absolutely everything can change when we decide firstly to change ourselves. See, most of us don't believe that. Most of us believe that everything around us has to change before things will be better. But the fact is that the only thing that needs to be changed is my own condition. And then everything around me will automatically get better. Including wars and including the other things. Now another part of your question was motivated by a spirit actually who has actually been in wars. Um, so there's some spirits around you who have been in wars and they are concerned about their location in the spirit world and why they're there. And they feel very justified, like they feel like the feeling they have is I wasn't a murderer. The feeling they have was that I did what I was had to do. Like I, I had to do it. It was defending the country. There's a few from the Second World War, and you know, I was defending our country. I had to do that. Um, I was asked to do it. We had to do it. That kind of emotion, and all that really is is a justification of unloving behaviour. And what we need to do, if we want to progress, and this applies to them in their progression, all we need to do is to stop justifying unloving behaviour 
and start seeing where we were unloving and release the emotional reason. So the emotional reason for anybody going to war is fear. I am afraid that someone will take something from me, either my house or my belongings or my children or my own life. I'm afraid, either way. If I work through all of those fears, my law of attraction will be such that actually those things will potentially not occur anyway. But even if they do occur, I'll realize that nobody can really take anything away from me because I'm this creator that can create anything I need at any time, at any notice. Right? And once I get to that state, obviously it won't matter what's taken away because whatever's taken away, I'll be given, get given again very shortly thereafter. So the key is to work through our emotional reasons as to why we go and do things. And most of the time with war, it's because we're told lots of lies that we believe of truth and then we go and fight for them. And uh, in fact, almost every single war that's ever happened on this planet has been for money and very little else. And in fact, war is manufactured by people in a lot of power in order to do monetary transactions that they couldn't do without it. And it's a very powerful thing once you start understanding that truth. Well, religion is all about power again. Wanting power, which in the end comes from money and, and, and power. And almost all religious wars have not been fought for the sake of a religious ideal, but rather have been fought for other very impure reasons. In fact, if they, you look at the so-called crusaders, the Christian crusaders during the Dark Ages, for example, who fought so-called for Christian ideals, if they were so focused on Christian ideals, they would have listened to my words that were written quite clearly in their own Bible that they could have read at the time, or at least had their priests read to them, of what the truth was. And that is that as soon as you harm another, you're not being loving to yourself or to, or to the other. And they would have automatically seen that. Just the golden rule itself being applied would have stopped any war from occurring from a Christian point of view. So it doesn't matter what the justification is in the end. It always gets down to power and money. And, uh, and once people who have been involved in war start to understand that and start to understand all of the problems associated with it and start to see their own part that they played in that, They'll go through a period of sorrow and repentance about it. And once they do that, that emotional condition will be out of them and they'll progress and they'll realize that there was no need ever to be involved in any war. And in fact, our planet will get to that point within a very few years from now. So, and that, that's something to look forward to and happening on our planet as well. Yeah. Right up, that's it. I asked um, a Jewish doctor, um, my doctor, a lovely man, uh, did he believe in um, redemption and closure? And he said no he did not I mean he's he's my age so he's very connected probably with the Holocaust and so on mm -hmm. uh, I have a situation um, I had a brother who died many years ago in the 60s uh, it was a suicide and the, he, his best friend um, followed him to the pub where my brother got very drunk in the morning and then my brother drove the car and it flipped over and he died and I think this good friend was also um, involved with my brother's girlfriend in some way uh, there was a, a thing of betrayal anyway and guilt that he yep. felt yep. and recently uh, after so many years he said that he wanted to talk with me and I had the feeling that he wants to redeem. So and he feels repentant or sorrow for what he's, <coughs> his part in it. I think it's crushed his life in some way. Mm -hmm. And of course it's, it's crushed my life and I could have felt guilt as well. I was 14 at the time, my brother was 18. I could have 
the guilt, well, I never stepped forward to, tr my, father, my brother had tried to s slash his wrists a week before he died and then, so there was this terrible desperation in him, mm -hmm. but I, I was such a sort of dreamy 14 year old, it never, my brother had withdrawn himself from the family that I didn't, I never went to him, mm -hmm. to, I never thought of helping him, you know. Mm -hmm. So there's a number of questions in there, isn't there? Yeah, there's sort of... There's the issue of redemption or forgiveness. Yes. There's the issue of, of your own feelings regarding... Maybe guilt. Guilt. And, and, and you know, I'm a survivor, survivor guilt. And, yeah. and this other person who comes from a family where he's, he has a handicapped brother and he's the only, he's a, has survivor guilt on both sides from his own family and yeah. through, through his involvement with my brother and our family. Yep. And uh, I don't quite know what to... Um, to do with that. Whether family. I quite... Like I sort of believe in carrying this guilt like a stoic yes. sort of... The like majority of us have this viewpoint uh, with guilt that we deserve to actually stay in this state somehow. Hmm. Um, how many of you feel that? Like you looked at some of the things you've done in the past, you feel pretty bad about them, and so then you go down the track of carrying the for the rest of your life in almost like a, a self-punishment. It's a sort of a, the motive of punishing yourself. Um, it's a common sort of uh, thing that happens with people, particularly people who have survived bad events when other people died. Uh, and, and particularly in families where there might be a sort of handicapped children and a, and a child that is not handicapped. Often the child who is not handicapped will have the same kind of feeling as well. It's an emotion that needs to be dealt with. In the end, what created all of these events are actually parents' emotions. So actually your brother's emotions uh, related to his eventual passing and his, his suicide and passing and all of the emotions that he had up until that point were actually created by his parents, not by his sister, right? Mm -hmm. so, so it's actually the parents that need to work through different sets of emotions. So um, if, we understand, if we can understand that the biggest thing that we can do for our own children is to actually work through our own emotional condition, that has a large and powerful effect on our children. The issue you're facing though emotionally is that you're desiring to carry the guilt in a form of self-punishment mm -hmm. in order to avoid a deeper emotion. Yes. You are in what I would call an emotion of self-deception. What emotions of self-deception allow you to do is they allow you to get away with feeling the underlying emotion. So guilt is one of these kinds of emotions. When I feel guilt, it actually gets me out of feeling a deeper emotion that's even more painful than the guilt. Which is? Deep grief in your case. Right? Just a deep grief and sense of loss and a sense of responsibility that you need to release. So you actually feel that somehow you were to blame for what happened to your brother, for example. And then that, instead of allowing yourself to feel that you were to blame, which is an emotion that you, could, you can allow yourself to feel, what you're doing is you're staying in the blame. So there's a whole difference between releasing the emotion from you and actually staying in it for the rest of your life. When you stay, stay in the emotion for the rest of your life, you damage the rest of your life. And it's a choice that you personally are making to damage the rest of your life in order to punish yourself for something that wasn't actually your creation in the first place. So it's quite sad in that regard. And this often happens with survivor guilt. They're actually punishing themselves for something they never created in most pla cases in the first place. Now, so there's that avenue. So my suggestion is to work through that emotion rather than, rather than enjoying the carrying of the guilt burden. Because yeah. in a way you enjoy it, do yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. It's a way for you yeah. to actually say, oh, I can't do that because I'm guilty, sort of thing. It feels righteous it to, feels right. to carry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the key is to work through the emotion of forgiveness of self. It's a major emotion to work through for the majority of people on the planet. 
if we never forgive ourselves we end up hardly ever forgiving anyone else around us either so it's very important not only for our own healing but also for everyone else's healing. It's almost an abstract notion though to forgive yourself isn't it? Yes so that brings up the question of redemption which is the original question you asked. Now that is a very important process in your connection with God. What, what I would call redemption or if we go back a little there's forgiveness repentance and redemption which are basically three three step process they are actual laws that exist in the spirit world and on here on earth that actually can help you greatly deal with the emotions firstly there's the act of forgiveness the instant you actually even choose to do something wrong God forgives you for that so even if you did it if you did it purposefully so let's say one of you got this emotion inside of you of anger towards somebody and then the anger turned into rage and then you decided you were going to kill that person and you went ahead and just killed them and you did it purposefully the instant you do that God forgives you so that's number one thing to remember but God doesn't take away the consequences of your behavior so God instantly forgives you. In other words, God has no emotional animosity towards you for doing it. So do you think God has any emotional animosity towards you for doing it if you did it accidentally? No. Definitely not. Hey. But if you even if you I'm saying even if you did it purposefully, God doesn't have any emotional animosity towards you. God has no desire to punish you, to make your life bad because of it. None of those things. God's laws automatically create consequence though so if I did that there's an automatic consequence on my soul right? so when I break a law there is a consequence on my soul you can actually overcome those consequences through two methods one is called karma which you've probably heard of or I call it the law of compensation what that means is I compensate for what I've sown so I sowed something I reaped the result I reaped the result and as a result of that I now have this emotion in me that I need to compensate for the original action so that means like let's say I hurt Mary in some way if I go through the law of compensation I would have to feel the emotions that Mary felt when I hurt her and I would have to connect to the reason why I hurt her and I'd have to work through those emotions and I'd have to feel the results of Mary's life of how I hurt her and once I've done all those things and felt about all those things over a period of time you can imagine that might take quite a long time um, I will then be in a place where I'm no longer paying the penalty the consequence if you like of what I've done and and there's a high likelihood Mary would also if I went through all of that that she would feel like she could forgive me does that make sense that's the law of compensation there's a, another law which is a divine law called the law of repentance if I have deep sorrow for what I've done and I, I desire to feel that sorrow and connect with God about that sorrow God can actually reach inside of my soul and pull out the emotional reason why I did what I did and that's a very fast process but highly emotional process that we can go through we have those two choices um, God offers us those choices one is totally self-reliant the other one is totally God-reliant with every single thing that's ever happened we have that choice so looking at this example with yourself you feel a deep sense that you can't forgive yourself for not helping your brother like when you could see the signs of him going down the track of probably wanted him to harm himself so you need to forgive yourself you're not forgiving yourself because you prefer to punish yourself you prefer to punish yourself because it's easier than it is to feel the underlying grief that you feel about your brother passing does that make sense and you need to allow yourself to connect to that grief and feel that grief can I ask how you feel about the the gentleman who now the best friend of your brother who wants to contact I, I you? Feel, um, compassion towards him so it's interesting you feel compassion towards him but not towards yourself <laughs> well he was probably in a more difficult 
position than I was, um, being of the same age, and uh, I think there was an issue of betrayal uh, yep. for him. Um, so wouldn't his situation even have more culpability than yours? Yeah, that's right. Um, so how is it that you can forgive him but not yourself? Ah, well, well you know, it, my brother was the only son, and I think my parents, in a sense, would have swapped me for them. Okay, him, so there's some deep kind emotions of thing in too, there. You know. so, yeah. Mm. So can you see that that's some of the emotions that you're avoiding feeling by just carrying this guilt with you the whole time? Um, I was talking to Sally about this last night. Sometimes we create another pain because the actual pain of what is triggered in us by an event is, seems so um, difficult to face that we create another pain. We, it's almost like a preferable pain. So for you it's the guilt. Uh, for me, uh, I um, had a tendency to get into very self-punishing emotions that actually prevented me from looking at the, the causal emotions um, within me that were being triggered. So for yourself, it's very similar. There's a lot of feelings being triggered with regards to your parents and feelings of being somehow rejected or the lesser loved child, um, feeling somehow responsible all, all of these things yeah is a feeling you have yeah mm. Mm. see that's a very very large hurt but in fact you haven't connected with that at all because you've spent a lot of time just feeling guilt and when you connect with that you'll be able to forgive yourself in the process and you will actually feel a lot lighter and your whole life will change mm -hmm. yeah. mm. thank you mm. can I comment about your Jewish doctor Mm -hmm. And many races on this earth now carry a multi-generational hurt Yes. where they feel they cannot forgive um, for what has happened in the past. The problem with that is that uh, it just perpetuates problems on this earth. For instance, um, Gandhi once said the words that an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. And this is a basic principle of love is that if we try for justice, we are actually not loving. You see, most of us have this tendency within us to want justice. We want things to be made right. We don't understand how God's made the universe and we want things to be made right rather than just to be loving. And in the process of wanting things to be made right, we often demand some very unloving actions of God. In other words, like, you know, he killed my son, now I want God to kill him. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Those kind of justifications. And if God won't do it, then I'll do it. <laughs> that even goes one step further. But all of those desire, a desire for justice is what's destroying the world in our interactions with people, with each other. If we can't get to a state where we forgive, actually, what we're doing is we're eating our own soul away. Um, about a year or so ago I spoke with a group of spirits who were slaves when they were on the earth. What happened when they were on the earth is they lived in a slave plantation where their entire life was built around the oppression of a slave owner to get them to do things, the slaves to do things for him. Right down to the women being raped constantly, the men being put into tiny little like what you would call dog kennels and locked in there every night. Um, and then they'd be brought out, whipped, and then made to work. And if, if they couldn't work with the meagre food that they were supplied, they were whipped some more. And most of them, of course, perished. When they passed in the spirit world, one of the emotions they felt was a deep feeling of rage towards their abusers. And that deep feeling of rage not only, not only kept them, it kept them in the first sphere, in a, in a hellish location in the first sphere, actually, for many years, the group of spirits that I spoke with were there for over 300 years in this place, in the first fear, just because they couldn't get out of this rage cycle that they'd got into. When we talked about it with them, they could, all we talked about was how that they just needed to grieve the process. They just needed to grieve what had done to them. And many of them instantly began to grieve as I was talking about the bad things that were done to them because I could feel the bad things that were done and I just reflected them back at them. 
and they started crying about the things that were done and the instant they started crying they could go to a new location in the spirit world that they'd been avoiding for 300 years and it was just the thing that was locking them was their desire to hold on to the sense of justice can you see when we hold on to a sense of justice we actually often are not loving even to ourselves and that's a, one of the main, it's a basic principle of love. And, and in that place we actually put ourselves above God. We say, my anger is going to punish this person. My anger is going to bring about the justice. Or I can't trust God enough to say, I can release this emotion and trust that I'll be okay, I won't be harmed again. And that God's laws are perfect enough to help that person deal with the consequences of what they have done. Mm. It's a very, very important principle and unfortunately many races that have been abused by other races have this long-standing sense of wanting justice. And this is uh, the whole foundation of all the problems in the Middle East, for example, is all this multi-generational sense of injustice that, that man himself wishes to correct. Uh, rather than just act in harmony with love. Once man starts acting in harmony with love, the feelings of wanting justice will disappear and instead forgiveness will take its place. And once forgiveness takes its place, this earth can change very, very rapidly into a place that's totally different. But until that occurs, the earth will remain in this state that it's in currently. And that requires, if you think about it, that requires action on each one of us behalf. And that action is any person who has sinned against you, any person that has harmed you, at some point you're going to need to go through the process of forgiving them. Which means actually going through the process of feeling your emotions about it, crying about it, and then releasing it, and realizing and not wanting justice for it. And when you do that, you'll find yourself to be in a far more loving state. You'll feel a lot better within yourself and all of a sudden everything around you will start changing. Does that make sense to everyone? It's a major problem on the earth, the misunderstanding that love is justice. And the truth is that there really is not justice in love. Love is higher than justice. Much, much higher. Than justice. If you can use the mic. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just wondering whether you could say the same about the perpetrators of abuse and power. You're talking about the cause of wars being power and money. There's also become a tradition amongst those people to per per perpetuate the, the abuse. And one only has to think of the power, of the British power, now the American power, and the perpetuation of abuse there is the same. Same abuse. principle us forgive even the perpetrators of abuse but also act in a manner in, within ourselves where we're not afraid of their abuse right then their ability to abuse us to get power or to get money or to get whatever else they want is going to be totally crushed like it's totally impossible for a person to get anything from you if you're unwilling to give it at the cost of your own life Because in the end, what is your own life anyway? Your life is eternal and you're not really giving away anything when you think about it. We just think we are because we don't necessarily believe our life is eternal. There's a lot of change that can happen on the earth when we get into this state. Mike again? In, your, in the first century, your ministry lasted three or four years. I think you might, might be on. Oh, sorry. So in the first century, your ministry lasted three or four or some years. I'm, I might be wrong in the numbers. I'm not a, an expert. You're correct you're out about that. Um, and you're taking a long time now in reincarnation to work through your emotions before you really start to take action as if it was a ministry. Um, you sent an email around and commented about some web page I went to where so some I mean that's just amateurish stuff to compare to what will happen when you actually start to take action. Uh, the, rea the reaction around the world against you will be enormous. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I'm just wondering, is there a pattern emerging? Do you really see it a very short ministry for you? <laughs> <laughs> this is one of Mary's major emotions. Interesting law of attraction for Mary. <laughs> Want to comment about it? <coughs> I hope not. Um, my feelings are that I won't pass. Um, in the first century, I did have a feeling that I would pass. Um, this century, I have a feeling that I won't pass. Um, it's clicking in me. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's a there's obviously a um, battery going up but um, it's a good question um, in the first century, I knew I was the Messiah in my early 20s. Um, and it took me 10 years from that point to actually begin my ministry. When I began my ministry, it wasn't actually me who made the choice to begin my ministry. God basically made the choice to do it. I reached that condition of at one moment with God and then felt impelled by God to take certain actions. And uh, the same thing will happen this time again, but not just with me. There's obviously thir there's 14 seven-soul pairs who are reincarnated for this purpose, and this will occur for them as well. And so this will occur for Mary and for others. Now, my feelings are that, uh, that once we... The, w the Earth is in a better condition now in the sense of a more open and receptive condition than it was then. But also there is a going to be a combination of events that occurs to that even make the earth and people on the earth to be in a more receptive condition. But you're right, there will be also animosity towards me. And, uh, and I feel quite strongly that my own condition and the condition of those that surround us eventually will be enough to prevent any negative events occurring. For us to have a long enough effect on the earth for, for there to be change. But uh, that all being said, um, at the moment it is one of Mary's major uh, feelings that she has that I probably will pass. Um, Which I'm aware creates a law of attraction, so I'm trying to work on it. Yeah. So we're actually, even you asking the question is one of Mary's <laughs> law of attraction. <coughs> um, I feel I will not pass. Um, and I don't feel that many of the the, the, the the only ones of the 14 who will pass have already passed. So the Apostle John has already passed and I feel that he will be the only one of the 14 who pass. That being said, of course, the 14 can choose to not deal with their own emotions too, which can cause a negative law of attraction to occur. But I don't believe that uh, that will actually occur, particularly once myself and Mary get into the con condition of firstly at one minute again and then, and then at one minute with each other. Um, obviously our ability, what we're doing right now is gathering, I suppose you could say gathering friends together. Um, so many of you are here not for any other reason than you're attracted to truth. Um, you don't necessarily believe that I'm who I'm saying I am in many cases, or most cases. You're yet to have any emotions about that for many of you. And so what's really attracting you is this resonance that you have going on inside of your soul of truth, you know, this feeling that I'm actually hearing truth here for the first time in my life for many of you. And many of you are demonstrating a faith as well. Faith is knowing or feeling that something to be true even though you're not yet experiencing it in your own life. So many of you are feeling these truths enter you, getting into a state where you're feeling these truths and then feeling that, hey, actually this might be right <laughs> and I might be able to go with this and things might change in my life and, and you know, it might actually finish up turning out that AJ is who he says he is and it might turn out that Mary 
who Mary says she is turns out to be that as well and then so forth and it won't that be an incredible experience so that's partly what's going on inside of many of you that in itself uh, makes you quite unique uh, un unbeknown to yourselves you are quite unique <laughs> in, in many cases some of you know your own uniqueness but one thing that's very unique for the majority of you is how much truth burns in you compared to the average person and how much it resonates inside of you compared to the average person and that's what's brought this law of attraction so what we're really doing at the moment what I feel I've been doing for the last five years is bringing together all of those persons who are going to be key parts of the changes coming on the earth because of these unique aspects within them not of any special physical trait or characteristic that they have but this unique thing of this desire and passion for truth and desire and passion to experience love and desire and passion to change the world around them and many of you have those desires and passions already right and that's what's causing this attraction so this period of time for me is very similar to the period of time that I spent from the time I was 20 or 19 in the first century till the time I was 31 uh, which was a period of 12 years that I went through in my own progression gathering my friends if you like and those friends turned out to be the persons who after I passed did most of the work in changing the world and I feel even if I passed after this period in time many of you with what you have learned will be the people who actually put those truths into action and change the world um, so I feel it's very similar in that regard there's a lot more information available this time and because it's written and videoed and and all these other ways um, it's obviously a lot more easily communicatable as well um, which which obviously is going to have its own benefits too so in the first century everything happened by word of mouth uh, and could happen no other way now obviously the soul attractions can happen in a much more powerful way because we've got the influence collectively to just by our soul condition changing to influence everyone around us and then we've got these different mediums these communication mediums which means that people can get in contact with us a lot easier and so at this point in time I feel there's going to be in the coming year in particular there's going to be a large growth in the people who are if you like the friends of the truth and those people will become very influential in further changes so while many of you are not influenced at this point so much to to practice these things you're hearing from me in your own life many of you still have your own doubts and your own feelings about myself even that yet to work through and all those kind of things what will happen in time is when these things are confirmed as truths to you which they will through your own development things will change quite rapidly after then and every single person who gets into that state can help another hundred or two hundred people and you know if you think about that it's sort of like a multiplying effect you know many of you have heard of the illustration of somebody who if you get something doubled each time then by the time it's ten times along there's like ten to the power of two you know two to the power of ten extra if you like and so what that does is it gives you not just the doubling of an effect but rather this exponential growth and that's what I feel will happen through your efforts not through mine um, I'm only capable of connecting to a certain number of people at once um, although the mediums available for us to do that at this point are much better than the ones I had available in the first century yeah so it's going to be an interesting time there's a lot more I could say about it but I don't want to freak you out too much about that because uh, <laughs> <laughs> many of you are not aware of the, the, the what's going to happen as a result of your personal efforts in the future but I'll leave that for your desire to work out so. <laughs> yeah. Sig thanks at the back if we could have a mic up there did some someone else down the There's front you guys wanted to ask questions <laughs> yeah. here we are That's yep. the question I've got is to reconcile what you said about that carnivores are animals as carnivores uh, as a result of the human soul condition 
And uh, how, do I, how would I reconcile that with the evidence of carnivores being on the planet before mankind was here? Uh, the it's question is, how can you reconcile the carnivore thing with the carnivores being on the planet before man got onto the planet? Yep. And um, God created a lot of animals and creatures on the planet in order to clear up or clean up the earth and keep it in a clean and pristine in a clean and pristine environment a lot of the animals that we now classify as carnivores which kill live food actually were created not to kill live food but to actually clean up the dead matter on the earth so in other words let's say um, a large animal died if there wasn't some insects that were carnivores that ate, that ate meat or, or cleaned up meat, for instance, flies and mosquitoes, you know, those kind of things, and then there wasn't some animals, then obviously these things would stay polluting the environment for much longer periods of time and they'd take a lot longer to decay. And God created a whole series of ecosystems that were surrounding the cleanup of the environment, of which what you call carnivore mammals and also other carnivore type of creatures are apart. They w their purpose wasn't to kill animals that were alive. Their purpose was to actually to to get rid of things that had that had died. And animals are actually very sensitive to life. This is why animals, even now in our current environment, know when an animal is sick and about to die because they're very sensitive to the, you could call it the smell of death, if you like. And the animals themselves were actually focused upon the cleaning up or the anim of these animals that had passed or died, the flesh of those animals. Now, history doesn't track when this changed, and that changed when man came on the scene. When man came on the scene and started exercising his power over other men and also the power over creatures, what happened is creatures started to exercise the same kind of power over each other. In other words, they started destroying each other before they had died. Um, and of course there is no historical evidence of this because it's, very, it's almost impossible to provide historical evidence except from the spirit world of people who were around at the time and uh, in time that evidence will be provided. So, so the reason why a lot of the animals do have like the teeth structure for example where they're able to eat meat and also the digestive systems where they're able to eat it and work and digest it is because they were created for the purpose of, of cleaning up carrion. Does that make sense? See? Like, yep. um, they of course don't need to eat it. They can eat like for, I, I gave the example of, of tigers and lions eating, eating uh, vegetation. They are perfectly happy eating vegetation, but they are also able to tidy up uh, the environment by eating this other, uh, eating meat that's died as well. Yeah. And this is also why these animals in the wild concentrate even now on only generally killing the animals that are weak or lame or you know, have the smell of death, if you like, on them. Hmm. There was a question down. There's a couple of questions down here. We can bring a mic down here. Here we go. Who wants to go first of you girls? Come on. I'll go first. It's pretty deep deep um, question. But since I've been watching, watching your DVDs over the last few months, um, or a couple of months, uh, I thought the... Um, or felt the soul um, body was quite an interesting and it touched a lot of um, places with me. But now I've gone on to the law of attraction and I'm halfway through the law of attraction but over the last couple of weeks it's really resonated with me quite deeply and brought up a lot of different emotions and particularly I've been having some really crazy dreams of my past and bringing up... I've come from a very... Um, uh, let's say um, abusive um, family situation onto um, uh, partners and right throughout my whole life and I feel that I've um, been bringing but I've been waking up screaming mm -hmm. um, and having to deal with 
all these re emotions again that I felt I've dealt with over the years. Okay. And um, I feel in my own self I'm a pretty um, loving and caring person, but never knew why I was always attracting these horrible situations throughout my life mm. and had to deal with them many, many times. And, um, and until I've gone through and, and looked at your DVDs and now I'm going through all these emotions obviously deeper again mm. and happen to see where I am and, and um, uh, why I'm attracting this through the law of attraction. So it, it's to me the question would be um, particularly with these dreams why I'm bringing up these deep emotions and I know it's probably to do with my self-worth um, why I'm attracting all this and why I have been for so long I get pretty emotional just talking about it now yeah. um, but I went th back through this one particular dream that woke up screaming and normally I usually have bad dreams like that of a past male who was quite abusive yeah. physically and um, this one was of my sister my older sister and um, she abused me quite a lot from when I was even born and didn't want me to come into the family and mum said she used to stick pins in my nappy and that and really did some horrible things when mum wasn't around when I was sleeping and I would wake up screaming mm -hmm. and in this dream I, she was trying to kill mum and I in this car and I've woken up really quite quickly screaming very loud and woke my partner up and tried to pacify me and I had to actually get up and walk around the house and, and take on that emotion of why was this all coming back up again because I haven't dreamt of my sister doing anything horrible for such a long time but I've been watching this law of attraction like every night and falling asleep with you uh -huh. you know listening to all this <laughs> and going through all the deep emotions and I, I, I know that's within my own self but yeah I suppose my question there is is of the dreams are they trying to show me of where I am or who I am or what is it trying to bring a message you know I know it's a difficult question I'm asking no, here, no, but it's not a difficult question well the dreams are there to trigger the emotions that's your law of attraction okay. in action so the key is not to try and analyze the dreams too much or what's the message go yeah. with the you're already in an emotion when you wake up yeah. feel that emotion so, and the, what you're relating there is that you slipped into confusion. Why is all this happening? What have I... That's it. Yeah. That's it. But the key is just to stay with the terrified emotion that you had and, and try and process that. And then there's some other emotions there for you about feeling like unworthiness, poor sense of self, that kind of Very thing, much. which has been a, an ongoing law of attraction. Very much. So the keys, don't, don't analyse it too much, okay. just trust your law of attraction is bringing you these dreams to trigger the emotions and tr try to process the emotions, stay out of the head. Stay out yeah. of the head and deal with the emotions, yeah. okay, and definitely the fear was there, the fear came up enormously. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's okay. a fear that you thought you had dealt with but haven't dealt with, Yes. and so the key is to allow yourself to understand that yes there's a whole deeper layer that you thought you wasn't there but is there <laughs> yes. right? and that has been bringing you the law of attraction now the other thing with dreams to bear in mind too is that it's a combination of help from your guide and yourself mm. so what happens is often we go into the sleep state at night and we sit down there and we figure all right I know this in the sleep state you can see your own emotions quite easily mm. right so I know this emotion of fear about my sister is still inside of me. How can I trigger it? Oh, a good idea would be, <laughs> right? I give myself a whole sequence of pictures. I talk to my guide about giving myself a whole sequence of pictures and waking me up just at the moment that I'll remember them. Uh, okay, because I remember them very clearly. Of course, and it seems to be more so since you've been watching the DVD. I have, right? yes. <laughs> okay, and this is what happens is we start realising that there's actually a lot of ways that I can actually access these emotions in me once I have a desire to get to them. Okay. So what's happened for yourself is you now have a desire to get to them, mm -hmm. and so I what do. is going on now is that you, you've, got a, you've found a fantastic way of triggering them, just the dream process, <laughs> and giving yourself these promptings right and so you've been doing that yeah. and the key is to keep allowing that to occur and not get too distressed about it okay once you have worked through the causal emotion you won't have that dream again because there's no point of it okay. and also even if you did have it you wouldn't feel it to be the same 
uh, you wouldn't feel the same response from it. Yes. So even yes. if you had the same replay, it, you would not wake up screaming. For yes. Example, if yes. you dealt with the aspect of terror of it. Yes. The truth is that because there has been a lot of abusive things happened to you in the past, mm -hmm. and it began with this terrible emotions projected to you by both your parents and your sister. Mm -hmm. um, your sister's emotions, by the way, was a reflection of your mum and dad's emotions towards you. Mm -hmm. So she would come and stick a pin in you. For the same for for the same reason why your parents the parents basically created that emotion in her. Okay. Right? Yes. She was just reflecting the emotion of them. Yes. The feeling that you know I can't look after a child right now. I can't have the child right now. It's not good that if it's a girl child, uh, there's a bit of that in there as yes. well. And so there's quite a lot of emotions that were bombarded at you at a very early age from yes. your parents and your sister was just reflecting those emotions but that's created a lot of causal emotions inside of yourself that you do still need to access and you are now getting to the core of it there's a group block of terror that you need to allow yourself to experience which you've been going through yeah. and then there's also a lot of feelings of worth attached to those which you'll actually access and you're starting to access now yes. and you'll work your way through those two probably using the same methods okay yeah. thank you because i have been praying for god to show me myself truth and well your <laughs> prayers are being answered girl <laughs> not in a nice way but yes no, no, i have to do nice with way. it it's far better it's far better you having a dream about this than someone coming along and sticking a pin in you <laughs> <laughs> right. i've Isn't had it? worse things than that but exactly. th that was the start of it <laughs> exactly so so actually this is one of the best and easiest ways for you to access causal emotion okay through the dream process it's one of the most loving things you could do for yourself oh. compared to not having that and having to get it happening through your law of attraction okay yes sense? yes it does so, yes so it's actually of your own it's created of your own desire to help you work through your emotion and it's a fantastic tool that you're using and it is very loving it's one of the most loving things you could do for yourself is it oh yeah. good <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was attracting more horrible things. No, no, what you're doing is life. dealing with the causal emotion of it now. Okay, yeah. that's what I want to do. And that's Absolutely. What you want. And yeah. that's, you've set your intention, you pray to God for that. You yes. Tr trust now that this is what, what's happening now is your, is your best way of dealing with this problem. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Like any other way would be more traumatic than this way that you're actually dealing with it now. Okay, I see what you mean. Okay. Because you would attract events rather than actually. Oh, dreams. okay. I see what you mean. Okay, yes, yes. And I'd rather do it that way. Yeah, much yes. better. Okay, so much better to have. Mary's real good at the dream thing. I'm terrible, with it. <laughs> and so I have to do the event thing. <laughs> Trust me. You want to do the dream thing if you can go away. With Wonderful. It. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. So the dream thing is a lot. It's just as powerful. And if you really use it appropriately, it can help you get into some really good causal emotion quite easily and rapidly without you having to re-experience it physically, you know, like, so. I see what you mean. I've actually had many, many dreams of, of and way past. And like, I've even brought up even past um, uh, relationships where I haven't even thought about these particular people it's only just since I've been watching these DVDs yeah. and I'm thinking why did he come up in my head you know it's like I'd sort of put him way in the past all the unhealed thing. stuff yes. all comes up, and everyone <laughs> finishes up going down the track of saying it must be something AJ does to me <laughs> like, he's, he's got some mind control there you go like, you know what I mean and it's not like that at all what it is is you've set your intention to deal with it and on top of that you're now dealing with it in the most loving way for your for you to deal with it okay. in my case i have a lot of trouble dreaming uh, it's rare for me to dream and so i have actual events occurring so mary will wake up in a dream with everyone being angry with her i'll actually get it in practice <laughs> 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 so it's, it's very different in practice than it is in the dream but it's just as effective in the dream if you tune into the emotion of it oh okay yeah. and oh. you're in the perfect place to start processing bed oh. In yeah. the yeah. 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 And I must turn off the video. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank so you. So it is a very powerful way for you to work through causal emotion. Okay, well with the dreams, can I just ask one more thing? Because sure. on the other side of the coin, I actually have some very loving dreams. And it's yeah. usually of one particular person, yeah. one particular male. But it goes right back to, say, my early 20s. Yeah. And, and shows me a really, really loving and very much connecting way. And, yeah. and that is quite a, a common 
occurring dream and I remember everything. Yeah, but there's also another part of that dream that you're not relating and that is okay. this feeling that you make mistakes in, oh, that, yes. or in that relationship. Oh, yes. And, and that you actually finish up rejecting the relationship mm -hmm. through your actions. And, and there's a causal emotion in here of an unworthiness to have a good relationship. It was exactly that. And I know that. I already know my mistakes that happened from there. And it was directly after but an abuse. say you already one. know. I do. But, <laughs> but you're having the dream. Yes, I am. I know. So the dream is telling you that you have yet to resolve some issues with this. Okay. Does that make sense? Deeper emotions Deeper in emotional myself. issues. Okay. The, it's actually almost the same emotion that's being triggered in the nice dream and in the yucky dreams. Really? Yeah, it's okay. this feeling of I'm unworthy yes. to have love from a male, I'm yes. unworthy to have a good relationship. In either way. Yeah, yeah. so okay. in the good dream, you, that's the feeling you're kind of left with in the end, yes. oh, I messed it up. Yes. And in the awful dream, men are actually enacting the feeling. Okay, of what I'm saying. with you now. I understand that now. I was getting quite confused with the two that's happening quite regularly. Mm -hmm. And yes, mm -hmm. okay. That's, so, that's me. so the good, Makes sense. the good dream, if we can call it that one, yes, because <laughs> they're all good dreams. They're helping you a lot. But the the good dream, the one that uh, is happy, it actually there are some emotions in you to work your way through of the choices that you made. One of the realizations you get to have is that you made a choice to reject the relationship mm. because of some underlying issues of un, of worthiness. Oh yes, Does that make sense? yes, and, absolutely. And you need to let yourself work mm. through that. Yeah. The fact is that you are attracting the negative, which you're finding distressing, mm. but you also made a positive choice to reject the positive. I know, and I, I listened to you say that it, during one of your, your speeches, and um, it just, oh, so many times in different things, <laughs> it just resonated with mm. me very deeply. So there's a reason even right now, because remember these are all unresolved issues yes. that you dream about. Yes. So even right now you are rejecting positive experiences because of a feeling. Okay. The key is for you to look at that emotionally. Okay, okay, thank you. I appreciate that. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Um, my sister too. Oh, okay. I'm not the one that pins in the <laughs> You're the pin person. Uh, She's the young one. She's the young one. You put pins in her, is that the idea? Oh. No, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Go on, Jim. Um, both my parents have had their gallbladders out and my two sisters, and it runs all through my mother's side of the family, mm -hmm. and I've just been diagnosed with gallstones and I'm booked in to have my gallbladder out. Mm. So with watching your DVDs and that, I was feeling that it's my parents' emotions and things like that that I'm carrying within, but also hearing you talk about spirit attachments. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering... Yeah, multi-generational spirit attachment here too, uh, related with the same issue, the gallbladder issue. Gallbladder is where in your body? No? Which chakra? Yeah. So... So it's like, it's in between the second and third chakras, isn't it? It's up here. Right. Yeah. And what emotions do you think it might be about? Um, Whenever anything gets stones, what would that tend to... Anger. Okay. So there must be some anger related issue here. Okay. So what do you well, think? Well, there was a lot of anger between my two parents. All I remember growing up is them fighting all the time. Yep. Um, yeah. Screaming, Screaming, shouting, fighting all the time. Yeah. Yep. A lot of rage in your family. Yeah. A lot of yeah. multi-generational yeah. rage in your family. Yeah. yeah. So what does that cover? Fear. Um, I didn't feel safe. Um, I felt very alone, abandoned. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, rejected. Yeah. So allow yourself to start working your way through some of these emotions. Um, in the book, um, the body is the barometer of the soul, it does list what gallbladder issues are all about. Um, I can't remember what they're all about now off the top of my head. But you'll find that anger is a large part of the issue here. And it's a multi-generational anger, so it's also attracting spirits who are in your family tree, reimposing this anger in relationships. And uh, the key for you to, is to start looking at where you're suppressing anger. Not just suppressing, you have a belief that you can't express anger, right? Your parents expressed lots of it. Yeah. And so you uh, feel now that you should shut it down. 
the irony is, is when we try to shut down an emotion, we just finish up expressing it anyway, in some way. So the key, the key for you is to look at what you're angry about. Let yourself feel what the anger is about. And rather than stay in the anger, which your parents have done, which won't help this problem if you do it, it step into the grief associated with it, the fear and the grief associated with these issues. So, so if you let yourself pray about that issue, you will actually identify quite easily what it's about inside of you. And if you look at your parents' emotional condition, um, you will see that there's something correlating in, in the multi-generational gallbladder operation, if you like. Okay. Yeah. Very much related to fear and the suppression of fear. Because also since I've been watching your DVDs, mum's um, become very truthful with me and she's also told me that um, she tried to abort me and also just within the last week that she tried to commit suicide when she was pregnant with me as well, um, yeah. which she got rushed to hospital yeah. with overdose. And, um, yeah. and I didn't know all these years, she, she always said like, she always says that she loves me and things like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, she's just never... And I've always been a mistake or something. She wasn't supposed to have any more children after the fourth one. Mm. So I've always known that, but mm. she's never... Until recently. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the truth is that a lot of your emotional condition right now is the, is the reflection of these emotions projected at you from your mother. Um, so allow yourself to connect with those emotionally and you'll work through a lot of stuff doing that yeah. and um and i know you're not afraid of that you're pretty no. yeah. you're pretty good, you're pretty yeah. good with your emotional yeah. processing work yeah. so allow yourself to just keep keep working your way through it and if you do you'll find that the gallstones will break up naturally that was my next right. question am i able to are you able to heal the problem? Yes, totally. If you actually find the causal emotion that creates your gallstones, the gallstones will start breaking up naturally. Your body can break them up as well as create them. Okay. And the key is to allow that to occur. But the problem that you face at the moment is that the problem might be too far advanced for it to actually stop you from, in the end, having to have an operation. Um, this is something to bear in mind with all of your progression. Um, Sometimes we begin trying to solve the problem when the problem's in an acute, in a, what's it called, acute uh, phase where it's, where, it, where it's quite bad, and, or chronic, sorry, chronic phase where it's quite bad, and, um, and sometimes we start with the emotion too late for the emotion to actually finish up resolving the issue. The truth is that the instant you remove the causal emotion, will be the instant your body begins repairing itself. From that moment on, you're fine. But a lot of us have our causal emotion blocked by a lot of blocking emotions, which also need to be dealt with before we can get to the causal emotion. And we also have some emotions of self-deception, which block our blocking emotions. So we need to work through those issues. And sometimes the process of working through those issues takes longer than what we can actually physically repair ourselves with. So just bear that in mind. So don't don't go don't go down the track of saying, "All oh, right, I'm never going to see a doctor again," and and uh, all I'm going to do is deal with my emotion. And you deal with some of your emotion, but you don't get to do the core. And of course, the problem is going to continue getting worse or remain the same until you actually get to the core emotion. So don't go down the track of sort of heavying yourself. Be sensitive to your body. You'll feel if it's getting better or worse. If it's getting worse then you might need to take action, other action. But understand that that action is not going to be a permanent fix for the problem. The emotion that creates it still needs to be released, even if you haven't got a gallbladder anymore. Uh, the emotion that created the problem still needs to be released, if you want to be at one with God. If, you, if you're already feeling quite emotionally connected, prayer could be a really good way of just really pinpointing what is going on if you ask God to really show you through your law of attraction or however however she sees fit to... You know. Yeah, that's good, that's good. And so look at your law of attraction right at the moment and just see what happened in the last week, for example. Because that will tell you any anger-based event that happened in the last week, underneath that will be the fear that's creating this problem probably. And, and even... 
Yep, so any angular base event including that will bring up. Yeah. And, and really look at even irritation because that's anger based. You know, if you look at any time you just feel a bit irritated or annoyed, try and feel about what that's about at a more causal level. Yeah. By the way, irritation is like the pinpoint of like huge rage generally. <laughs> so, so, you know, irritation is a good way to find what you're really, really angry and upset about. I, my whole processing really changed when I changed from the saying, don't sweat the small stuff, to always sweat the small stuff. <laughs> as soon as I did that, every little thing that was coming up, I'd look, okay, what's this about? Because that's a law, law of attraction event, and it, if I look at it then when it's small stuff, it prevents getting into big stuff, you know? I, I'm taking more notice. Because when we're at one with God, we won't have any little irritation at any time during the day, so yeah. yeah blissful existence, no irritations. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. Every celestial spirit is in that state, they'll tell you how good it is. <laughs> what we want to do is get that state happening on the earth. Mm. Nathan, had a question. Oh, Nathan had a question behind me. Um, why do you think that uh, God created us in the first place, especially knowing that Amun and Aman are going to go over to self-reliance and then down we go and then we've got to go again anyway? Mm -hmm. um, the answer is really, really quite simple. And that is God created us to, to express their love to us. So it's like God created beings, which were an image of God in nature, and God created that, created children in other words, in order to express her love to those children. That's the only reason why God created us in the end. Now, how it's become distorted is we've rejected that love. And in the process of rejecting love, we then are on our own. We, we, we create an environment where we're now self-reliant and that creates huge distortions. Um, and so almost all, all the pain that we are experiencing now is the result of those multi-generational distortions that have occurred. But in the end, the, the, the basic reason why God created us was to love us so that God could express her love to another being who had its own free will. Mm. He's a she and she's a he, she's a she. Yeah. God has a, is not, uh, doesn't have gender, but I often think of God as my mummy or my daddy. So. An entity. Um, An entity. A being. Was Just, human or was, no, was? No, never was human. Oh. As far as I'm aware at this point. I just wanted to ask Nathan what emotion drove his question. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mary. <laughs> uh, it would be the same old intellect thing, just wanting to try and box God into my little world so I can understand it rather than feeling it. It would be that, that yeah. same <laughs> stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's good. Just, so, yeah. So that's an emotion. Yeah. 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 yeah the control Just thing. Getting you to be an emotional detective with me. <laughs> <laughs> we know how much trouble you have with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, love you guys too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we do it because we love you, Nathan. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, if we can go across to this lady over here. That's all right. I've forgotten your name, sorry. Kerry. Kerry, that's right. Um, getting back to the uh, law of attraction, um, I've had a lot of that um, lately. Yeah. Once again, the law of attraction DVD yeah. has helped. Um, recently, my husband came home last week and he came home limping. Yeah. And uh, it was his right uh, Achilles heel. Yeah. So he walked in and I said, oh, you've been having problems with men. <laughs> and, um, and obviously issues with work. And he said, yep, 500 of them. So he came home limping. Yeah. Friday morning we woke up and he annoyed me um, by turning the TV on, that is. And um, so I dealt with it emotionally and as I do and bit his head off. <laughs> and, um, is, that, is that dealing with it emotionally, is it? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then I walked off thinking, well now you should be limping with your left foot. <laughs> 
okay. and within about half an hour, um, our daughter got up out of bed and stepped on a piece of glass with her left foot. Oh. So I was just thinking, well, she caught, she got the brunt of, of that. Your reflective of your reflective yeah, Of my, um, and we've had, that's the second time my son also had the glass thing. And in one of um, your um, DVDs, you said headaches reflect sadness, mm, whereas my son, sadness, yeah. um, my son um, has suffered from migraines from a very early age. So is that like deeper sadness or? Yep. And again, it's a reflection of your both parents. Mm. So um, there's the issues that you have towards men, mm -hmm. which you need to be addressed. And your son's feeling quite a lot of them, feeling terribly sad about. Mm -hmm. And that is then suppressed by him. Uh, which creates a lot of his migraines. You releasing a lot of your emotions towards men will help, will help, her, will help him. Um, but getting angry <laughs> is not the way to release it. <laughs> when I say getting angry is not the way to release it, you do need to connect to your rage. Um, but uh, step underneath that and actually connect with your grief about it. Your daughter reflected a self-attack emotion. So. The fact is that when um, your f husband got up, turned on the telly, and it annoyed you, the actual underlying emotion was an emotion where you weren't being valued. You, you felt you weren't being valued, created by actually some emotions inside of yourself that you don't feel valuable, even to yourself. And your daughter, uh, it's a self-attack emotion which your daughter reflected by her left foot getting cut. So every single event in your life and particularly events surrounding your children are a, a complete reflection of what you're suppressing within yourself. I watched the um, the parenting DVDs. A bit too. confronting, hey? It was huge, and I'm getting to a point now where I am totally aware of everything that does happen. But it's the why, or not, and not, but it's like, okay, what is that? Why has that happened? And what is it that needs that I? Uh, that's where I'm losing. Yeah, the but connection is getting lost with me. Mm -hmm. Every time something happens, I know it's happened for a reason. It's and and because it's with it's happened while I'm present, I know it's my emotion that needs to be dealt with. But it's like finding. Yeah, but can I emotion. just clarify something for you though? It's happened because you do not want to know the emotion. You think you want to know the emotion, but if you wanted to know the emotion at the soul level, the event wouldn't have happened. Right. Well, it's like the law of attraction. If, if, if I was just feeling all of my emotions in every moment, I wouldn't need a law of attraction event to trigger an emotion within me. So your children are actually part of your law of attraction. Very powerful because they're so sensitive to whatever emotion you're denying in yourself. They immediately reflect it. Or, they, or there's an event involving them that triggers the emotion that you're in denial of. Yeah. So, do you understand, whenever anything happens to our children, it's because we are denying the emotion, not because we want to know what it is. Do you understand that? Does everyone get that? Like, things that happen, are bec they happen because we are wanting to not know what it is. If we wanted really to know what it is, then it would already be beginning to be lessened, like the, the actual events would lessen straight away. It's the desire to not know that creates our worst law of attraction. Do you follow me? Mm -hmm. So that being in mind, I would be better off saying, I don't want to know what caused my daughter to <laughs> harm her heel, because if I did want to know, I would probably have not created it. So the best thing to do then is to talk to God about why you don't want to know and to ask yourself questions surrounding why you don't want to know, not what it's about. So in other words, instead of asking myself questions, what was this about, I'm better off asking myself questions, why don't I want to know what this is about? <laughs> Do you follow me? Because actually, there's a whole group of fears that you don't want to know that is actually creating these events. And what you will need to do at some point is allow yourself to know what you're afraid of. And so, um, and most people are not aware that when these events occur, most of us are trying to jump straight into the causal emotion, not recognising, in fact, that we don't want to know what the causal emotion actually is, because we're afraid of it. And we need to know, firstly, why we're afraid. 
Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. So talk to God about why you're afraid, mm. what you're afraid of, rather than talking to God about telling you what the actual underlying emotion is. But see, that's the thing. I'm, I'm, I, I don't want to go there. That's, that's ah. the thing because well, one of my questions was going to be, um, how far back to your childhood can you remember? And the lady back there answered that before. And whereas I don't remember much before I was nine. So I think, I assume that whatever is there before I was nine, I don't, and that's what's preventing me from going forward because I don't want to jump into that big pit. So pray to God about getting the courage mm -hmm. to actually f remember everything. So how do you remember, does it come back in pictures or does it come back in feelings or? Mostly emotions, emotions. but it will also be pictures and words sometimes, but mostly emotions. So it'll be like fairly detailed on exactly why you're holding back those? Yes, usually, but mm -hmm. initially, obviously it takes a bit of time to get to that point because there's a large group of fears suppressing those emotions. So my suggestion is start dealing with your fears not necessarily with the emotions. Does that make sense? Focus on your fears, why you're afraid. Talk to God about getting courage. Now ask for courage, like ask God to give you the, the quality of courage to deal with your emotions. Ask God to show you what those emotions are. And if you feel inside of you that you don't really want to know what they are, to say to God, I don't really want to know what they are. I realize that that's going to create problems. Can you show me how I can get to want it? Want it? Um, and once you do that, you'll find that things will be shown to you so you get to a point where you do want it. And once you get to that point, then things happen quite rapidly in terms of remembering things and getting to underlying causal emotion. Yeah. Thank you. No worries. Now, it's five o'clock. Uh, we've been going for five hours already, guys. Um, I don't know how you guys feel, but you've probably... I can feel that the majority of you now are quite tired, so probably had enough, although some of you feel that you haven't. <laughs> I can feel that too. <laughs> um, it's been really, really lovely meeting you. And for those of you who have met for the first time, uh, it's been enjoy we've had a good time with you and, uh, and we've enjoyed your company a lot. Uh, we're going to be up at Armadale um, Wednesday night. Wednesday night. Uh, so we have another session Wednesday night, Armadale. Obviously, it's a fair way between Armadale and here, so many of you won't be there. Some of you will, I know Ken will be there. Um, but uh, what, we'd like, uh, what I'd like to do just in, before we go is just encourage you to keep working through these issues with God. So encourage you to just start developing a relationship with God rather than like trying to do all of these things without God. Trust me, dealing with them with God is a lot easier because you get the